So once again, playing to a packed house, <laughs> the man who needs no introduction, <laughs> Dino. Apparently I do if we need more people. <laughs> okay, welcome to part three. What we're going to talk about is the deployed list network as well as probably a half a dozen use cases on um, how you can use it. So this will be pretty applicable to, you know, IT people, people that want to deploy features, that sort of thing. So uh, we'll give you a summary of the part one and part two, talk about the, tis, the LISP test network. We'll describe some network debugging tools that we're using. And then we'll talk about uh, a pro bono use case, um, two enterprise use cases, a service provider use case, uh, three data center use cases, and then f conclude with LISP mobile node. So um, summary of the first uh, presentation we gave, part one, we were talking about routing table growth. Um, you're not, yeah, you're not expected to read all this. This is just here to say that these were some of the high point slides from the first part. You know, it's, uh, a it's a yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm I'm repuking this is what you're saying. Okay. So uh, uh, we talked about routing table growth and how this can help, but we talked about how uh, polluting the internet with more specific routes and PI prefixes. Um, is uh, making the routing tables get larger and how LISP can help with that. We talked about um, how you separate ID from location and the DMARC point is where the LISP encapsulators and decap decapsulators are. Uh, the level of indirection that LISP provides you is that you can keep these EID addresses fixed while you are able to change the locators. And so you don't have to renumber sites, you don't have to renumber systems or virtual machines, and you just change the locators. And therefore, we have this uh, mapping between an EID and a set of R locs, um, which is part of the mapping database that we talked about in part two. Uh, we gave an example of unicast packet forwarding and multicast packet forwarding, talked about um, how to solve the MTU issues associated with encapsulation. And then we talked about locator liveness. How do you, when you decide you want to use a locator to encapsulate to, how do you know if it's up and you should use it versus another locator in the locator set? And then uh, we talked about standardization of LISP and an open policy where LISP is completely open. Um, even though people from engineers from Cisco are working on uh, LISP, there's no Cisco IPR on it. It's completely open. So when we showed the unicast packet example in part one, we showed that the encapsulator had a cache entry and knew where to encapsulate to. Well, if the packet comes to that encapsulator and it doesn't have a map cache entry, how does it go get it? And so we described um, the mapping database system. And we described what the scaling parameters and requirements were. Uh, we talked about some various algorithms. Uh, we said that we decided to use something called ALT, which is in the middle of this, um, is in the middle of this uh, cloud here. We talked about a mapping service interface by using map resolvers and map servers, which are boxes you add into the infrastructure, don't have to change existing boxes to, to realize the mapping database. Um, then we moved on to um, how to interwork non-list sites with list sites. And we talked about a NAT solution briefly, and we talked about these things called proxy ITRs and proxy ETRs, or proxy encapsulators, or proxy decapsulators. Uh, we put it all together in this one diagram down here where how it all fits together and how we can change the mapping database if we need to without changing the sites. And we talked a bit about security, um, indicating the perfect is the enemy of the good. And so we have to be careful that we don't have too much security mechanism and not realizing enough security, but just enough. Talked about LISP and Traceroute, how Traceroute um, gives you the entire path, regardless if it's an EID part of the segment or the locator part of the segment, and how we have a tool called LIG that queries the mapping database just like DIG would do for the domain name system. Okay, so let me go back, okay. So let's talk about the LISP. Um, we call it the LISP pilot network, the LISP test network. It's quite real. We're doing a lot of experiments on it. Uh, the point uh, being is that we're trying um, to build it out, not get terribly large, but just enough so we show some kind of internet structure on top of the existing um, internet. We have about 60 boxes deployed now in 10 different countries. You can see the platforms range from ISR, Nexus 7K, C200, ASR 1K. Those are the number of boxes per platform right here. 
Um, we're running the two operating systems at the moment. Later, we'll add iOS XR as we see fit. Um, what we try to do is build, we call these boxes in these various regions um, after the registry names. So we, I, we actually have this box sitting in Amsterdam, and there's actually somebody at RIPE that's actually running it and being part of our test. And of course, we have a, a couple boxes in Virginia. We have some, a one in South America and Uruguay, and the APNIC box is sitting in Sydney. And we're the, there's stub sites sitting off in it. These are the names of the, of the sites that are connected. There are a lot of individuals, uh, some companies. You'll see Facebook, MSN, um, Savis is part of it, um, ICANN, those sorts of, um, sorts of people. These MSSPs are map service providers, and they're actually trying to model um, multiple MSPs at this um, level of alt so they can aggregate up but yet provide options for somebody who wants to purchase mapping services from different uh, mapping service providers. This is a blow up of this region right here. We'll show you that in a little bit more detail. So what we do is the two Aaron routers are, are dual homed. Um, the red addresses are locators, of course. Uh, we, it's all dual stack. Uh, we show that this region here is MSP1, which is basically um, most of the West Coast sites connect to it, and this is MSP2, where the East Coast sites are connected to it. Right now, they're doing IBGP over GRE tunnels to each other. This is all a tunnel topology because this is a control plane, technolo control plane technology for sending map requests. That's the sole purpose of this. You want to send a map request from the source site to the destination site you want to talk to. You want the ETRs or the decapsulators at that site to give you the locator set so then you can, so then you can encapsulate and send packets to them underneath. So this is the, the hierarchy that we have. And you could see that these stub sites will register to these map servers. These are map servers, map resolvers, and they'll register, and we call it slash 24, slash 28 routing because they're getting prefixes out of the EID space and these guys are storing them. And when they go upbound in the hierarchy, they, they allocate to slash 21s, and then these guys allocate to slash 19s. So if I get something that's, if I get a slash 24 from Aaron because I'm in the US region, and I want to use MSP1 because they have better service, I could use them. If I'm no longer satisfied with their service, I can go to MSP2, but still the same aggregation northbound is the same. It still aggregates up. This, this is supposed to have a connection to the alt directly. Uh, I don't know why that's not there. I think it's just a typo or something. So the idea here is, is that I could switch service providers as a stub site and be, go, be able to go to either one if I want different service. So this could be um, a VeriSign. This could be an Equinix. It could be a Google or MSN if they want to provide mapping services. Um, it could be an ISC or a DIN DNS, those sort of companies could provide these services if they're going to be third party. Service provider could also provide these services and package it with their link sales that they send to you. You know, you could say if you buy bandwidth from me, um, you can also get mapping services for free or, or whatever. That's the idea. This region here are the actual the proxy boxes that will actually provide non-list sites connectivity into the list world. And you could see we have one at ISC, University of Oregon. Andrew Parton has one up and Equinix um, has one up as well in Ashburn. So, so the name there, where, that it's only has a, a proxy ITR? Yes. Yeah, the question was, Andrew, this ASP Pitter box, it's a proxy ITR, yes. So he's actually taking packets and from non-list sites going to list sites. And the list sites that want to return packets will just send them natively if their service providers don't URPF fail because the source addresses coming from the list sites will be EIDs and you have to make sure that they don't URPF. So the PXTRs mean that they support both functions, yes. But I actually have a question about the previous slide. Sure. There are no or so the question was, is there any FreeBSD or Linux implementations running in this network? Uh, it turns out there is. We have a free BSD implementation of LISP called OpenLISP that's being done by uh, Luigi um, and Damien. They're out of um, Germany and Belgium. And, they're, and so this is supposed to be used to, to, to support multiple implementations as well. So as more implement, implementations come up, we, I, I didn't, um, 
add a slide about implementations, but there are five distinct implementations of LIST right now. And at the last ITF, we did a little interoperability thing. So there's there's the open LISP implementation by uh, Luigi. There's um, a Linux implementation um, by uh, two IETFers. There's iOS, there's NXOS, and there's a click implementation that runs on Mac OS. Did I get all those right, Daryl? Okay. So the goals of the network is obviously to do experiments, to learn about if the protocols will actually work in practice rather than on paper. Uh, we are changing the standard or the, the internet drafts as we learn things on the network. And we're trying to not to get into the same problem we had over the last 20 years with BGP, where BGP, the spec, and BGP, the implementation, are completely different. We're trying to keep things in sync so uh, somebody who wants to implement LISP can actually look at the spec and it could actually interoperate with previous implementations. We really want the multi-vendor part of this to, to work quite well. So as we learn things from experiments, we want to adjust the protocol in the architecture if necessary. Uh, we're trying to be careful about feature creep because a lot of people want to jump in and say, can you add this, can you add that? So we're a little bit careful with that. Um, we do want to test multiple implementations, as I brought up, and uh, we're starting to do that on that test network as well. Uh, we want to prove that this alt topology uh, maps EID, the EID allocation delegation maps to the topology rather than the other way around. And using the slash 24, slash 28, agreeing to slash 29 to slash 19 is supposed to emulate that sort of behavior. And we're hoping that that will uh, be able to be enforced when a real um, mapping system gets put in place and that we can control the back doors and, you know, the, the, the triangle sort of thing. The, the horizontal links need to be at the same level of aggregation, and as you send advertisements up, you aggregate. And we're hoping we can do that. And since the since they're, these boxes are easy to deploy because they're separate boxes that run on PCs, perhaps, and have GRE tunnels, it's easy to rehome these things. You don't have to provision links and, you know, do all this layer one stuff. It's all over the top type stuff. And, of course, we want to emulate the MSP business models because that's kind of new. We like to model it off of DNS-type services. It's just working at the network layer rather than kind of the application layer. So uh, we believe that people will have um, a dependency or a contract with, with their EID prefixes. They'll buy their EID prefixes from the registry, but they'll have a contract with a mapping service provider to get them advertised. This is completely decoupled from the underlying connectivity that you have. So you don't have to depend on the person or the organization that's giving you links, um, link connectivity for the addresses. Therefore, you can change service mapping service providers or change underlying service providers without having to change the other one. And that, that's the decoupling that and the level of indirection that you get with LISP. Um, protocol learning um, tool for users. We can, when people want to see the stuff live, we can log in and say, look, here's a trace route. This is how things work. It's a great learning tool to show it in action and show how real it is. So that's a, that's a big advantage too. And uh, it's a test bed for building management tools to see if we need more, more tools uh, to test LISP. This is an, a web page which bas basically does a lig to all the devices that are on the network that basically tells you, um, you know, what site they're at, what box is being pulled, um, what their registration is, what EID prefixes they're registering, that sort of thing. And then we have um, somebody that has built a, a LISPmon um, thing that basically tells you where all the list boxes are and you can click in and find out what their status is and just to do some, you know, network management sort of things. Customers. Well, I shouldn't say customers because I don't think they're buying Lisp yet, but these are people that are interested. These are people that we've talked to, the Lisp group. Um, these are either people that have received a Lisp presentation or are on the network or are proactively helping us design it. And you can see they're from kind of all walks of, of many different sectors. And, um, you know, a lot, I mean, we went to the financials like a few times. They're very interested just because they don't, IP address management and moving virtual machines around is a big problem they want to solve. Of course, the cloud providers, I mean, I should have put Google in there as well, but they're interested because they want to move topologies um, quite a bit. And the handset vendors as well. Google maybe should be in there as well. So, so when people hear of LISP, uh, what do they actually say? What are the sort of comments? When they, when they hear the presentation and they see the level of indirection, um, what are the sort of comments they say? And, 
you know, they say things like, oh, I want to, I would like my, to make my enterprise core network simpler, and I can do that by removing routes. Having less churn, less flux in my core is a good thing. So removing routes in my enterprise core, my data center core, or my internet core even is a good thing. I can allow my client machines to roam, and I can track them since EIDs never change. So that's kind of good where um, now a device is associated with an IP address, which is called an EID, and that EID never changes, so it's always associated with one system, process, virtual machine, no matter where it's currently located. I can use either global or private addressing and not have to change them. I own my addresses. I have control. So yeah, you could actually build VPNs and duplicate your addressing because as, you, as it goes over the LISP, it's just encapsulation and consenting sites can run whatever they want. They can run IP version 10 if they want to, right? I would like to multi-home and use private addresses, but it's so hard to do with NATs. I can do that now with LISP. Multi-homing is very difficult with NAT. Multi-homing without NATs is difficult because you have to run BGP at the sites. So we're going to make a simpler way of doing multi-homing. I think I can use list on my PE routers and use BGP next hops as locators. Now my core can stay clean of external routes, and I don't have to use MPLS. Okay, and right now you can get all your external BGP routes out of the core because from PE to PE you use MPLS labels. But now what you can do is you don't have to use MPLS, and you can get your external routes out of out of the core and still have PE to PE, and you could actually go from PE to a PE and another service provider because the tunnel encapsulation could go across um, service provider boundaries where that's never done with MPLS. If I commodify list priority and weights, I can use list for load balancing traffic to servers. Well, that's just dynamically changing the priority and weights, and we believe that those two policy attributes, the priority value and the weight, can be used um, and dynamically change based on using the traditional things you do in load balancers to find out what's loaded and what's not. I can get IPv6 at my remote offices without creating my core. We talked about that last week. You can run anything on the edges, and you can use any kind of address as an EID, and what you encapsulate over is what is supported in the core. So you can run IPv10 or IPv6 over IPv4, and it works because we're mapping one type of address of any format, could be a MAC address, could be a name, to something that runs in the core. I care about leaving a robust and scalable internet when I retire. I want the internet to be green. Okay, that was Dave Meyer. Okay, he wanted to leave. He wanted to leave a clean internet to his grandchild. His grandchild now will be grandchildren soon, but he basically wants to have the core clean and scalable so we can um, keep the internet cheap. Or there'll be something else that will be the internet that we have to might we might worry about. So that kind of is a segue into the pro bono use case. Is we would like people to pull their prefixes from the core. It's either the internet core, the enterprise core, it doesn't matter. If there's less resources being used in the core, we have a, a greener core. We use less resources, less memory. Maybe you can get devices that are cheaper. Maybe router vendors could deliver things faster because they're just not memory upgrades, but they're feature upgrades. And of course, you'll lose le use less power. And the core will be cheaper to operate. Th these are all good things. Uh, it'll be greener to deploy a PA-based IPv6. Most um, prefix um, allocations for IPv6 are going to be PI. If we continue this, we're going to have flat routing in the core. Will that actually scale? So we can keep IPv6 EID prefixes out of the core. And guess what? If we don't have any IPv6 routers moving packets, we're going to have to keep those prefixes out of the core. Okay? So let's look at the first uh, low OPEX multi homing use case, enterprise use case. So the use case is basically multi-homing that we've been talking about. Multi-homing is on the increase. People want more bandwidth. Uh, the internet is just as important as water. It can't go down. Uh, you need multiple links for redundancy. So people are going to, they may have multiple links to the same service provider, but there's a good chance that they'll have multiple links to different service providers. Um, and they want to do it active-active. They want to use both links. So when one link goes down, they use 100% of the other link then. Um, and they want to use it quick. They want to switch over quick. So we want low OPEX switch over, and we don't want to have this conditional advertisement stuff that we typically run in BGP on S1 and S2. So we want it to be um, low OPEX. We want to use more efficient bandwidth use for the site. 
all the bandwidth is used for because you pay for it. The site should be able to decide um, how it uses the link. If it's 70-30, depending on the, band, the, how, the speeds of the link, or should it be 50-50? And there'll be new link revenue for an ISP. So an ISP should like this because as it's more multi-homing and easier to multi-home, they can attract more customers sooner. And so they'll, um, they'll be able to attract more link benefit um, at the benefit of keeping those sites routes out of their core. So they can sell uh, new bandwidth and they don't have to pay for it in terms of routing table entries in their core. And we decouple the addressing from the ISP so the site has the flexibility to change providers. This is really powerful. Now, a lot of people say, oh, the service providers aren't going to like that. Well, if you want his customer and he's your competitor, it is a good thing. Yes, you better keep good service because you don't want to lose your customers. But the class can be half full. It raises the bars for ISPs to have better consumer sites. Okay. Question on this? You probably heard this uh, in the previous parts. The next use case is dynamic and roaming VPNs. Okay, so we have this situation where you have these five physical locations uh, for, say, a company that has um, five offices. And let's say uh, engineering is in San Francisco and New York and marketing is in Boston and Los Angeles. And you see that they're all multi-home to the enterprise core. You see all the red addresses, which mean they're locators. And you see the green addresses. I hope, I hope that's showing up. But the green addresses are the EIDs. And you'll see that, um, that the engineering is using global PI addresses because it wants global connectivity. So they're using prefixes out of 1.116 and 1.2.16. And you see that a mapping entry for this site would say this 1.2 slash 16 has these two locators, 64.1.1 and 65, or 65.4.11 and 65.4.2.2.2. And you know that the core is using global PA addresses, right? So we're able to keep those green addresses out of the core. That's good. And let's say marketing wants to use private addresses. Well, their addressing won't clash with anybody else's addressing because it's all encapsulated and, and the core is just routing to red addresses. So we could actually use 192 addresses or any, or any type of private addressing to talk to each other, and that works. Of course, the addressing has to be unique inside of the EID prefix or you can't make a TCP connection to you. If you try to make a TCP connection to somebody else that has the same address as you do, you're going to make it to yourself, right? Can't get the packet out of the host. But what we can also do is we can take this engineering site here in New York and we can have it move to Dallas. And of course, the prefix and all the routes and all the devices just move here. And then all that happens is um, the locators change. So this is a way of a site actually moving and just not one machine, but it's an entire topology that can move. And by doing that, that if, if you can move a site, you could dynamically create a, create a site as well because a site just comes on with a new EID prefix with new locators. It registers itself to the mapping database, and that's how people find it. And, you know, when you have these server systems that are sitting here, you go ahead and put... In DNS, you put the name to address mapping out of the EID space. They never have to change. If you move or, or, or stay still or um, create something new, it, the addresses always stay the same. The mapping, the DNS to address mapping always stays the same. Let's go to the service provider use case. Let's say a service provider wants to support multiple address families. Well, the Internet core is not dual stack. We tried for the last 13 years. It's not going to happen. So we have to figure out a way to deal with it now. I hope we don't have to do translation because that's going to be very painful. I hope IPv4 hosts don't have to talk to IPv6 only hosts. But let's just look at a few combinations. Well, like I said, if you have an IPv6 only, host, uh, only site here and IPv6 only in the running list on both sides, it's really easy. This is an IPv4 path that encapsulates from this point to this point. The inner header. Has an, is an IPv6 header. The outer header is an IPv4 header. Okay, If that IPv6-only site wants to talk to a dual-stack site, um, it's just running LISP. This is LISP, and that's non-LISP. It doesn't matter what protocol family it does. But obviously, it's going to encapsulate to a decapsulator, which is a proxy box. And that path right there is IPv4. It, it will then forward natively to this path, which is on IPv6. Okay. Oh, oops, go back, okay? This case is a list site that's, um, that's dual stack 
that's also talking to this dual stack non. As you can see here, what we're showing you is that all these possible combinations can work because we always encapsulate in what's homogeneous from this path to this path and what's homogeneous to this path to that path. This is an example, this bottom two clouds are an example of what I did with ipv6.google.com is that I'm a Lisp site with IPv6 EIDs connecting to Google, which is an IPv6 site with routable IPv6 addresses. And what I would do is encapsulate my packets to a proxy ETR. And the reason I do that is because when my ITR here said I wanted to talk to this 2001 um, address, it wasn't in the mapping database. So that tells me it's a negative cache entry that if I either try to forward it natively or I encapsulate to a proxy decapsulator. The reason I don't want to forward it natively is because I don't have IBV6 path between these two points. So what I do is I encapsulate it to a proxy box, which decapsulated and has, it has IPv6 connectivity to Google, and then that, that goes directly. So this is a tunnel path, and this is a native path. This is all the IPv4. All the purple here is a tunnel path, and the yellow is a native path. What if it's the other way around? This could be a possible uh, cable company that has an IPv6 core and can't upgrade the residential sites because they're running set-top boxes with IPv4 and the truck rolls are just too expensive for them to convert all the residential sites to, to IPv6. Uh, so what do they do? Well, if this is me today, an IPv4 only site, residential, running private addresses, if I'm running Lisp, I can encapsulate the IPv4 packet in IPv6 because that's the only thing that the core network supports. And then it gets decapsulated by an IPv4 only site that has a server using a global address. Okay. Likewise, if I'm a list site that wants to talk to a non-list site, of course this address here is a globally routable address. So I encapsulate my IPv4 packet over IPv6 to the proxy ETR and decapsulates it and forwards it natively on this path, which is probably going to be a few hops through the head end to the um, to the data center or whatever. Questions on service provider use cases or enterprise use cases? Let's go to the data center. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Good. Yes. So the question was, is a lot of the examples we showed are showing multi-homing with a couple dual home, basically. But what if you, let's say we have hundreds of connections that go outside. How would you use Lisp to give you the level of indirection? Because you're going to have 100 locators, basically. Right. So what we're, So the real limit here is most of the protocol is designed to deal with 32 locators per EID prefix because we have a bit field in the data header that's right. advertising locator status bits. But um, what it means is, is that you get 32 locators for a given EID prefix of any length you decide. And if you have 100 type connection points, you're probably going to regionalize the EID prefix and you get 32 times each one of those or 32 per each one of those. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty hard limit. You don't have to use the locator status bits. You can use probing between the ITR and ETR to find reachability. So you don't even have, you could turn that L bit, the locator status bit off in the data packets and not have to use them at all. And therefore the map reply then just gets larger, larger. we can fragment and reassemble it because it's a control protocol. So you could actually run with more. But if you want all the features that have all been talked about. It won't let a, it, I mean, uh, a map request is sent, a map reply comes back. If you can receive a 9K MTU-sized map reply, then life is good. If not, it gets broken up into multiple. So it's one times N RTT or whatever, you know, that's all. Let's talk about data center. The, one, the first use case is going to be uh, virtual machine mobility. 
This is an example where these two boxes are first top routers, A and A prime. They're, they're layer three boxes, they're running Lisp, and they're directly connected to these four servers, S1 through S4, okay? Let's just say, I know I'm wasting address space big time here, but let's just say these are on point-to-point -point links and that these are the addresses of each of the servers. Well, it turns out that all these ports that are off of this L3 box can register an aggregate, say, to slash 16 to the mapping database saying that the locator is A, which means me. Anything that's going to go to any of these servers, please encapsulate the packets to me. These two boxes are just a legacy IP router. So they could be, you know, Cat6Ks, Juniper boxes, doesn't matter. Okay. Same thing over here. This, re this guy registers the 2.2 slash 16 with A prime as it. So what we're going to show now is what if S1 moves or a virtual machine on S1 that comes out of that address 111 moves to S3, what happens? Well, A prime can tell when this guy sources packets that it's not coming from this subnet. And when it's not coming from that subnet, that triggers a mobility event saying somebody just moved on to my subnet. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to register the host route saying that the locator is me, A prime, no longer this guy. This is right here is a route that goes, this is a mapping that goes into the mapping system, not the underlying network. It doesn't even get advertised throughout the alt either. So it's actually going back to the same map server that's covering 101 slash 32. I will show you that in more detail when we talk about list mobile node, which has a much harder scaling problem to solve than virtual machines. So that's the fundamental idea. Now what happens is as S1 sending packets out now on this new path, it has to update the cachers. The new guys that want to talk to will go to the mapping database and get A prime as the locator versus A as the locator. But existing cachers have this. A, so you update them and say you solicited, we call them SMR, solicit map requests to the cachers so they can update their caches and now encapsulate to A prime. That's basically how we will get VM mobility to occur, notice, across subnets. You don't need a layer two domain anymore to be able to get V motion to work or Hyper-V or whatever. <coughs> Questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So, uh, I believe like there are some uh, channels that is going to extend. Then, uh, or is it something like you will uh, currently submit to all the? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So the, that's a good question. The question is, is there's an update here, um, and do you have to flood it to all the people that might care about it? And the answer is no. There's no flooding. It's not. We don't classify it as a mapping update because the slash 16 is a completely different mapping entry in the database than the slash 32. So look at it as we're adding this new entry to the table, and it turns out to be a longer prefix. So when people want to send to 11 slash 32, they use A prime. Anybody else in 1.1, they use A as an encapsulation. Now, the only, the only site, the, the only place that has to carry the slash 32 is the map server for 11 slash 16. That's the only one who has to store it. And the current ITRs that are encapsulating to you. Those things are done dynamically. And they're done dynamically by saying, if I'm going to send packets back to the guy, it's only active flows that are going to be updated. And the guys that have gone silent, even though there's somebody that has a map cache entry pointing to A, if they're silent and not sending data, we won't update them. So everything in Lisp is pretty much on demand if you need it. And we try to do it fast when we think we need it. The, the reason the cachers know that the 111 slash 32 is no longer is associated with A is that when data packets start flowing egress from A prime, it knows who he's talking to. So he knows who the locators are for those destinations. And what he does is he tells them that send a map request to me, and then there's an RTT time where he gets updated. The st yeah, that's what I'm talking about is live folks. The live flow is talking to somebody on the other side that's Lisp aware. Either it's the the L3 box that's talking. That's there's an ITR on the other side or a proxy ITR. That thing has to get updated to know to send packets back. It comes to A prime. And we do that with this thing called an SMR. So what ha let me give you an example. 
So 1111 slash 32 is sitting there on S3. It sends a packet to something called 10.1.1.1. This guy may already have a cache entry for it, but if it doesn't, it sends a map request. Okay, that map request will go to the site that has 10. Now, don't forget, that site that has 10 does have a map cache entry for us, but has the wrong locator. That's what we're trying to fix, right? So what happens is that map request gets sent over to the 10 site, and what's in the map request is actually this guy's new mapping. So he gets piggybacked in the map request. The guy can, that guy at 10 can actually just cache it if he wants to do it on a, an honor system, or he actually can verify by sending a map request back with the same nonce, and then the map reply happens. So what I do is I send a map request to you, but I'm, I set this bit that says, I'm soliciting a map request from you. I want you to ask me what my mapping is, and you're going to send it with a nonce, a 64-bit nonce, then I'm going to send a map reply back, and then I'm going to give you this new information. It takes three halves RTT to do that, but you don't have to do it. It could take a half RTT if I just say, Here's the SMR, but it is a map request packet, and the source, this information is in it. You can believe it if you want. And we, we see in a data center that that's probably going to be trusted because it's managed by all one, um, you know, administrative control. Go ahead. Right. Right. If there's no, so you're saying if the, if most of the traffic is unidirectional coming from the remote site here, you know he's going to be sending to the old place. What can he do? Well, one thing that A can do is he can first tell the mapping system that he's no longer the locator, and he could find out by doing a database mapping lookup that A prime is the new locator. He could just go. He could query the mapping database to find out where he moved to. He's not going to be able to do anything until he lands. When he lands and gets registered, only after at that point he can find out. And when he finds out, he can either proxy map reply or he can actually tunnel the packets. We don't propose him to tunnel the packets horizontally because we don't want the hairpin, okay? So there's all kinds of options. Those are all various options we can do. But, you know, when you're running something like VMware, they give us so much warning that they're going to move we're going to be all ready to go, and the guys are running TCP, and they're doing heartbeats before they do any, before they say, okay, now let's do real data. The network state will be all created by that point in time. You should ask that question again when we bring up mobile node, because that's where it's harder, much harder. Yes, go ahead. This one, yeah. Yeah, the overlap. So if somebody asks for 111 one, one, seven. One, oh, oh. So they get a mapping that A, but they also, in that response, they have to get the more specific also, right? Because they're confusing and not even catching what it is. Oh, so I, th I think the question is if somebody has 11 slash 16 cached and now they want to send packets to the 111 slash 32, what will cause them to send a map request? Because they'll just map, they'll have a map cache hit and won't. Oh, no. Yeah. Yes. That map request will go to the mapping system that will return, what that will. This guy just returns slash 32. He doesn't have to return the 11 slash 16. So if it's going though, it's something under the A, 1112. Yeah. So you'll get a locator for A. Yes. But that will indicate for the slash 16. Yes. Prefix, right? Correct. But since there is some more specific, they'll also get more specific than that. They. Right. So, so I, th I think I understand the question now. You're saying should the old guy, A, return back the mapping 11 slash 16 and all the more specifics because that guy who's doing the request may want to talk to the moved machine and we want him to use locator A prime and not A. Right. That, that's the question, right. Yeah, so in the multi-homing case, we call this nested prefixes. In the multi-homing case, you have to return all the more specifics. In this case, you may not have to because 
this guy's always going to talk to if, – if somebody's going to initiate a sin packet a completely new place and he doesn't have it cashed, he's, he's okay. If, if, um, if somebody already has 111-16 cash because he's talking to S2, yeah. and now all of a sudden he wants to start talking to S1, the ITR says, oh, I know where S1 is. It matches the slash 16. He's at A. But really, S1 has moved, right? That's the case. So that, that, that's exactly like what I thought you set up first, and you said no, but it is the same case. Okay? It is the same case. So what you have to do is this A has to know that, um, I mean, it, in this case, we want A to return 11-16 one, one and this guy to return just slash 32. If this guy is... Uh, if there's anybody new that's talking, yes, he will go to the old place, and it'll actually degrade to the same case as what this gentleman said. What the problem is, he has to know, he has to know that one 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 has moved, and he'll know because he'll he he keeps staying here knowing that one 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 has moved, and he'll either do a mapping database lookup to tell that guy to go to A prime, or he'll reencapsulate the packets and go that way. It's the exact same case. Okay. So yeah, I mean. What's hard about this handoff problem is not only do you have to know where the new place, the new locator is, you also have to know that the guy is no longer at the old place, and you have to make sure that the state is kind of in, same, in the same phase or out of phase, right? And the problem with most mobility problems is, especially with mobile phones, is that the VM that's moving may not be at the old place or the new place yet, even though the network's trying to set it up saying where it's going to go. And everybody says, what do you do when it's off the air? Well, you can't communicate when it's off the air. There's nothing you can do here, right? So you either drop packets. If you start encapsulating here before he arrives, you're dropping packets here. If he gets here and you start sending packets to the old place, you're dropping packets there. So what's the clean switch over? What we're trying to do here in these boxes is not depend on any signaling from the host. We're trying to solve it all in the network so it's transparent to the host. But if the host can give us a signal that I'm leaving now, don't tell anybody about anything until I land. And then when you land, you do it. Then life works pretty good. And there's, I mean, like right now, VMware is an example. We'll send reverse ARP and announce when he's here. And that's when this mapping registration and updating the caches can work. VMware could actually tell us the flows that it's talking to. And we can say, oh, I'll do a database mapping lookup for all the current flows that it's talking to. And then if I see some that are in the same slash 24, I send one request get the prefix back in the map reply, scan all the flows and say, oh, these three map to the same prefix. So you can actually do some clever scaling things where you don't have to send n map requests for n flows because they may aggregate to the same region of the network, which is typically the case moving from one data center to the other because of the, the prefixes are much more controlled than on the capital I internet. Yes? Yes. Same will, same will happen here. And this is the example. Um, you have a machine at your house that's talking to this IP address. And there's somebody either at your house, there's an ITR, or there's a proxy ITR that is encapsulating to its current locator. When that VM moves, you are still sending packets to the same IP address because it's EID. And the ITR will find out its new lake locator and now encapsulate it there. That's an example over the capital I Internet. The, the mapping service um, is there because when new people want to talk to the VM where ITRs don't have a cache, they have to look up and find the locator, just like they would have found it when it was sitting in its home area. If you've been talking to the VM, it's a change of a locator in this case, and you are, your cache will be updated by this guy because this guy has a TCP connection with you at your house, and we know packets are going to be sent back to Stephen's house, and what that means is his ITR needs to be updated to find out the new locator. And that's what we do with this SMR exchange, send map request. That means that the, the global mapping service needs to be aware of the moves. The moves down to, down, potentially down to plus 32 in the ID. Yes, but you'll see how we can make it scale. That's, that's the sugar at the end of the presentation. Oh, go back? Oh, okay. 
So, you, okay, you guys are really interested in this slide. <laughs> That's very telling. <laughs> Good. Go ahead. Yeah, the A could ping the IP address and find out if it's there. It could probe. There's all kinds of implementation techniques. It, it can look at data activity and decide that it's been quiet and therefore maybe it moved. If it's quiet, it could actually check the database and say, let me look up 1111. If it looks up 111 and gets the slash 16 back, it means it didn't move because it didn't get registered in a new place. Oh, wait, wait, let me finish. There's a lot of more. There's more to it. Now, the other thing is the host could actually send packets and say, I'm moving. And, and you know, Hyper-V and VMware and Zen and um, the Red Hat one, KVM, they all have their ways of signaling to the network that we could use. And those are all implementation techniques that we can enhance the convergence of the move. Okay? So we don't, but we don't want to have to depend on a day one because we'll see if we could do it without signaling from the host. Okay? So, so we, we know, A, will know when it moves. Okay, and if it's getting packets, it has to make a decision to say, the some policy decision is, do I hairpin and start sending, do I get these encapsulated packets, decapsulate them, re-encapsulate them and send them there so they can be delivered? That's just like mobile IP, right? It's the triangle routing problem. We could do that as well. We don't want to because we want to be better than mobile IP. We want point-to-point -point tunnels because I want this stretch between you and me to be one. I want the stretch between the, the client at Steven's house to the VM to be stretch equals one. It's encapsulating from his ITR and be de-encapsulated by A prime, which is an ETR. Yes, uh, IPv6 mobile IT does that eventually, yeah, yeah. But you need IPv6 uh, forwarding in the core. That's a minor detail. <laughs> well, let's go to the next use case, the data center use case. So. We need 40 gig and 100 gig yesterday. Everybody's been telling vendors that. <laughs> yeah, I'm asking the same question. And so most, what, the way people are dealing with upstream bandwidth today is they get 160 gig by 10 times 16, where 16 is usually what the ASIC support on the number of ECMP paths. Well, if you add a little diameter to the network and you put LISP in here, you can get 256 paths wide. So what we're showing here is that this is an encapsulator, a LISP ITR. These packets come in. These packets, these, these packets will match to one of 16 different locators that you encapsulate to. Those will be looked up into the FIB. Each one of those locators will match a FIB route that maps to 16 different next hops. And if you do that with hashing, you can get 256 wide going to the same 16 different ETRs that decapsulate and then deliver to the destination. Okay. So 256 wide because we got 16 times 16 because of the level of indirection. Questions? You don't want to put in more routers. That's what Scott's thinking. <laughs> huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you want that random number in there, right? Yes, it does. So here's the final. Um, use case for a data center is load balancing the load balancers. So what people are have problems that they're having today is that packets are being addressed to VIPs and these servers are all being used up, but the VIPs aren't getting enough um, spread because of the way packets are coming in. So what you can do is you can treat the virtual IP addresses, which are the IP addresses of the load balancers, as EIDs. And when packets come into these ITRs, they can decide which ETR they decap that decapsulates it, and then we can spread the load across these load balancers. So each locator maps to a set of load balancers that have the same VIP, and then they could load balance here. So it's hierarchical load balancing that can be used. The final use case. What if two mobile handsets could roam and keep a TCP connection established? What if two mobile handsets lisp encapsulated to each other and had a path stretch of one that they didn't have to go through a home agent? The home agent is a data plane path 
where packets that return to the mobile node have to go through the home site because its address is topologically from that home site. Well, now that we have a locator ID separation, the ID can roam anywhere, and the location is done part of the separation and doesn't have to be topologically restricted. So we always have stretch of one for all LISP encapsulation. What if we can put up server functionality on a mobile handset? Well, you can certainly do that now because um, www.abc.com always maps to the, ones, the same EID. When it moves, you don't have to change that entry. You don't need dynamic DNS. Static is sometimes good, especially if it never changes. What if your handset could use all radios at the same time? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? So we're going to say this thing, or an Android, is a single Lisp site. It's going to have an EID prefix. could be IPv4, IPv6, but this is a prefix that's burned into the SIM, perhaps. And it's going to be configured with a map server that you know is aggregating. This is a map server that you're buying service from that's topologically aggregating this EID prefix into the alt. Here are the two locators, one for each of the radios. And this guy now can say if he wants active-active on these two interfaces or active-backup. It's just like a multi-homed Lisp site. So how do we do this? Well, we can run a very lightweight variant of Lisp on the mobile node. It just does basic encapsulation, really simple, much simpler than what an ITR does, okay? And that's documented in the internet draft uh, there. The EID is burned into a SIM card. It can be either uh, IPv4, IPv6 address that never changes. That will be your network name. This is cell phone number portability brought to IP. We're doing IP number portability now, okay? They'll be yours forever. That's your network name. You're, now when you land on a, if you go out of signal and you come back in to a Wi-Fi, WiMAX, 3G, 4G, whatever, you will get a DHCP address. That is your locator because you're tapping into the topology of the network. So you have your binding. There's the EID, there's a locator. And if you're getting a DHCP um, leases from both all your interfaces, that's your locator set that you register with the EID. Now, the, the mobile node carries along the map server because it always wants to register to the place in the alt topology that's going to aggregate for you because we don't want host routes to be in the alt. It's not on the underlying network, but we also don't want it on the alt. Okay? So when you get a new DHCP address, you register your R looks with the map server, and you update the cachers, just like we talked about in the mobile, in the virtual machine case. Okay? Can this scale? Well, we leave our looks alone. They map to the underlying physical topology. That's why the DHCP lease has told us where we are, and that routing is already routing to that subnet or whatever. So there's absolutely no more specific routes in the core for the list mobile nodes or any other list site for that matter. The more specific state is only in the map server. The map server has to track the slash 32 because the site that's advertising that EID prefixes is pointing to locators at the home site, not where the list mobile node has moved. Okay? So the map server is kind of like a home agent, but it's a home agent in the control plane, not the data plane. That's what makes it different than mobile IP. The map server already has a covering route, so no more specifics are injected into the alt. Very important. We will keep that alt pristine as long as we can. Okay? The only other place where the more specific state has to be put is in the people that are currently talking to you, the cachers. And that was the point that you guys are homing on. So how, ca how bad can that be? Let's have a look. Back of the envelope calculation. What if we, a map cache entry, say in our implementation, a map cache entry cost you 1,000 bytes of memory, okay? Violet means it's memory cost, red means it's R load cost, and green means tracking EIDs and map cache entries. That's the scaling parameters we have for this calculation. What if we said we wanted to support 1 million entries in an ITR? That would cost you 1 gigabyte. Okay, that's not terribly a large amount of memory. So let's look at a Google ITR. A lot of cell phones are coming up. They're roaming all over the place, and they're doing searches. So the ITRs at Google will have to support a gigabyte in their ITR, and that means that single ITR could talk to only a million cell phones. Let's keep scaling up. Let's deploy, deploy 100 Google ITRs. Now we're up to 100 million mobile nodes. That's not too bad. 
uh, let's throw more memory at it just by a factor of, of 10. And now we're up to a billion mobile phones. A billion mobile phones in 100 Google devices. It's going to turn out to be that way anyways. 100 ITRs is not unreasonable since good user experience forces shortest exit. So we know that those ITRs are going to be regionalized anyways. So an ITR doesn't have to support 100 million or 1 billion. It only has to support 1 or 10 billion. And then we just cluster or we array it out this way to get to a total of 1 billion cell phones. Oh, by the way, 1,000 bytes per entry is fairly fat. We can optimize that, maybe not by an order of magnitude, but maybe by 2 or 3x. So we just added some more factor to it that can help. This is probably achievable since granular state is only kept where it is needed. Comments from you guys. What's your reaction? So the question was, is this, is this dependent on the default TTL, the map cache entry of 24 hours? No, it's shorter. So, 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 right. I, yeah. The memory didn't depend on it, but, the but the churn in map requesting. Right. I mean, what's the minimum as a minimum TTL for the entry, is that what you're asking? So we think it should be, OK, it depends on a lot of things, and there's trade-offs all over. Um, it depends on how fast you want to roam, and if we, we could, we think we could do it at minute granularity, but it turns out when a mobile phone moves, it could maybe clear its cache, and when it clears its cache, it could send map requests and then tell places where it's currently talking to at the application layer what the new stuff is, just like the SMR example that I used you. When I get home, I want the server to move, the service to migrate onto my PC at home. So, so now I've got DNS service migration, dot, 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 Scott, is moving, and I also have the mapping changing. So now I have two TTLs. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Before we go to that, when you go home and you haven't connected that in yet, people can still get to your web server at your mobile phone at home, first and foremost. Right. Okay. Right. So, you, so what you would do in that case is that the EID would move to the physical server at home. The, yeah, well, yeah, because, yeah, well, I'm, the EID is associated, oh, okay, so you want the EID to be mobile. What we're saying is, right, so you want the www.scott.com to actually go to a different physical server, but you didn't say if the address should be the same or not. Is the EID the same or not? Or are you, you're asking, let's. Right. right. Mapping at the DNS name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's kind of outside of scope of what okay. we're doing because we're doing it. The, the key into the database is the EID, and anything that happens above it happens independently from it. Go ahead, uh, Daryl. So that's a quick fix. Right. Right. Let, let me repeat that so the people on the video can hear. Is So Daryl said the best way to do that is make your TTL lower for the DNS name and higher for the map cache. So you keep re-requesting for a new DNS name. And if you get the same EID or a different one, either one could roam independently of that, but this is just connecting to a different physical server at that granularity. Okay. Sure. Right. And so, you know, as a, as a trigger, you know, sensing that you're on the same layer too, you know, can, can trigger move from mobile node to, you know, to a stationary device? 
Yeah. It, uh, yeah, yeah, good point. Well, yeah, I mean, that's exactly like the VM mobility case, but the only difference here is the Lisp functionality is on the mobile node, and you're moving the server functionality into a host that's not running Lisp, but the XTR that's running at your site is the new locator. So what could happen is just by changing the locator, when the new locator decapsulates and finds out where this new EID is, it can now send it to a completely different machine because of layer two. Um, it certainly could, just like the A and A prime example, where we said it could reencapsulate to the new place. Yeah, I mean, now, now, but it it, uh, it wouldn't work that way. It would work the opposite way because everybody's still sending to the mobile node. It would have to tell you to now start sending packets to the mobile node uh, to the stationary node, right? That's yours. Yes. Right. Right. Okay, so I think that's, I mean, we should go think about what's a, a scalable way of doing that, but the note to take Daryl here is that um, they want EIDs to actually move on different physical devices because it's more of a, a service address than a physical address. Well, it's possible that we can solve this even more quickly than Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's just saying it's a non-problem, but but it's that it's a it's a it's the mobility yet at another level, right? Right. I mean, I just want to. There's a clear delineation. I think between the service mapping and, and the network mapping. Yeah. The interaction is always going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. You're Daryl saying do it at the DNS level because that's where the level of indirection now is at. Yeah. Well, I could argue that maybe another. I could argue that you can use any cast addressing and make both systems the same IPv4, 32 bits, and you can use an instance ID which is prepended to tell you, is it an instance ID that's a high order part of that address is actually the mobile phone versus the stationary phone. And that could be used as a lookup into the database mapping to find out really where the place to go. But that's just another level of indirection that happens inside of the EID space. So, that, I mean, there's some interesting things we could think about there. Do you think this is going to be popular, Scott? This feature of moving server functionality from one device to the other. Yep, yep, yep. When I get home, right, I, I set the phone down, right? I plug it in, I walk into another room. Um, and so once again, and you, want it on, you want the notifications to be on your home devices now. There's a different means of getting my attention when I'm at home that generally involves more things ringing. Right. Um, or perhaps you know, something different shouting. Or more things not ringing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right. Right, right. Okay, cool. Very cool. So this is uh, following the, the last slide. Just want to let you know that we've run this idea over the last three years through people that have gone through these sort of evolutionary uh, technology um, attempts. Uh, we did talk to Vint. We, we had a, Dave Meyer put together an economic workshop. I think it's been about two years ago. And Vint came and we gave a presentation. Um, he liked... Uh, Lisp more for the mobility reason than anything else. Um, Dave Clark liked Lisp because he said, oh, now I can build IP version 20 between these consenting adult sites and we can encapsulate an IPv4 locators and we can build this new, we can build new internet because we could do whatever we want. And I think I've talked about this a little bit with Stephen and VJ at times. Noel kind of works with us on a daily basis. He kind of, I'm going to give him credit as the locator ID separation visionary because he talked about this 15 years ago and was part of his Nimrod architecture. That was a, a candidate for IPNG where SIP 
was the winner of the IPNG wars, and it became IPv6. Uh, Paul Machapetrius, uh, if Dave was here, he would coin the phrase that Paul said that uh, list works in theory, or list works in practice, but not in theory. And I thought that was a compliment, actually. So he um, went, is going through the same, he went through the same struggles that we are about dynamic updates. And he said, we're not going to do dynamic updates to DNS. And he went 15 to 20 years without dynamic updates until that was added later. So he could understand that that's going to be the hardest part of the design to get work and scaling. And you guys have already brought that up. We went up to uh, Seattle to talk to Len Bosak, founder of Cisco, and said, Len, Len, what do you think of all this? He goes, oh, it's boring. It's just another encapsulation. And I said, thank you. That's what I wanted to hear. So that's it. Here's the references. Uh, that's pretty much all I have. Willing to take questions. Which uh, use cases do you think are compelling? Or throw out the ones that you think are not compelling that I brought up. Yeah, I, I think the mobile node case will really help get IPv6 deployed as well because if you really want global addresses on your mobile phone and you want two mobile phones to roam with stretch one and keep the TCP connection up, there are no solutions today that can do that. And, um, you know, mobile IPv6 can't do that. Mobile IP has the stretch of greater than one because of the home agent. So I think this, this part, what LISP brings to the table, is new and more efficient way of moving packets. We really have to make the implementation lightweight, the, the mobile node implementation lightweight, and that's the key. And that's why, you know, thanks to Steven, he gave us uh, half a dozen Android phones, and we're doing an implementation now. And we're going to find out in the, in the coming months um, if we can make it really simple. The difficult part is it's part of the IP layer. It's inside IP, so it has to be put into the kernel. I mean, this is going to be hard to do it on iPhone because we can't do it in user space, right? So that's why we're playing with Android since it's open. Um, the, well, it's on the mobile case, the, the Yep, I agree 100%. In, the, in your data center, use case number one, um, the, again, that really points out the need to, you know, if you're, if you're serious about having a, a stable presence on the internet in a, in a list enabled world, you have, to, you have to control your own matching. Um, you know, in, ensure that. You have to control your own map server. You, the site that has EID addresses, should control your own map server. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, because there, you know, we all know the function of an SLA. Right. right. And there's no, you know, if, you know, if someone, if some, you know, someone can, can, can prompt an SLA, but you know, if they're, if they're just letting map services run off to just run out of VM. Some site in the internet that through, through which they deliver service suddenly deploys this you know, VM portability service inside. So there's an explosion of right, know, right, 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 of slash 32s. Yeah. Because of you know, also you know, everything being deactivated Thanks. in the slash 32s, right? That prevents me from serving a map entry um, that will cause you know, users of the internet to be directed to the right thing. Right. Right. The, the, to not abuse that, right? Yeah, I would I would argue that the sites that want to control the advertisements in would run 
their alt BGP connections directly into their ETRs. And if you wanted to support mobile nodes that the map servers run on those boxes, but they're only to support the prefix that you're injecting into it. And that's an example, I think, which you're, yeah. Yeah, because we just don't want any slash 32 to show up anywhere because it doesn't work well for scalability, but it may have all these policy and security issues that you have to worry about as well. So, um, yeah, hopefully a map server address that's programmed in a phone cannot be changed by the user at all, that it has to be somewhat hard-coded or it's like a serial number, or, you know, it's factory installer. You can't change your IMEI address exact or number, right, exactly. So it's something like that. Yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know if that's a feature or bug, but, you know. Right. <laughs> Power users. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Thanks for coming, guys. I hope you enjoyed the three-part series. We had some continuity with a few people, so I appreciate the people that came to all three of them. Uh, hope you got something out of it, and we look forward to working with you. Input is uh, really, uh, really appreciated. Thanks. Thank